Okay, so welcome to the short course on deep learning and neural networks. Um, this is a topic I'm very excited to talk about. There's a lot of exciting things, as you may know. So for example, um, just two years ago, um, Microsoft had this impressive demo where they used deep learning to, to improve a speech-to-speech uh, speech speech translation system. And here you see Rick Rashid, VP from uh, Microsoft, demoing the system. And you see in, in New York Times, they say, scientists see, scientists see promise in deep learning programs. You can also see, um, not too far away at uh, Stanford and Google, they also showed Im impressive improvements using deep learning. Um, this is on computer vision where they showed that using deep learning trained on lots of YouTube videos, um, they can make the computer recognize cats in a lot of different objects. Okay, so there's a lot of excitement in this field and maybe that's why you're, you're here today. And um, you can see even Facebook recently launched a new AI lab and they, they handpicked um, Yang Li Kun, one of the, the pioneers of this field to head their lab and they want to revamp AI. So there's a lot of hype and a lot of, a lot of excitement in this field. And I think um, you might want to decide for yourself whether this is something you want to work in or not. So the kind of the goals of this talk, this uh, lecture is to show you what is deep learning and see if it can be useful for your own research. Okay. So, so just on, in a nutshell, what is deep learning? You can think of it, it's basically a family of methods that use a deep architecture to learn high level feature representations. So I'll explain what I mean by these later. But basically the idea is this, um, in standard machine learning, you usually have some raw data and from the raw data you get some features. That, and you get those features by hand engineering using your intuition. And then given these features, you train a classifier and this classifier will, will make some intelligent des decisions. And this is a standard process in machine learning. In deep learning, what's different now is rather than hand engineering all these features, you're going to make these features trainable using a deep network. And by using a deep network, you can sort of go from the raw data all the way to a high level classifier in one joint step, okay? So that's, that's in a nutshell what's deep learning, okay? So here's an example of this trainable feature. So this is a, a deep neural network by Honglak Lee. And basically what he wants to do is from image, he wants to predict faces and different objects, okay? And you can see using a deep architecture, the first architecture will learn to recognize edges of different orientations in the image. So you see these are sort of edges in different degrees. And then from these features, you can combine them to form parts of faces. So for example, this and this may be combined to form an eyebrow here, right? So this is the second layer of features. And finally, from the second layer of features, you can combine to form faces. And from these faces, you can do face recognition or different kinds of object recognition. So the idea is that if you have a deep layered architecture like this, then you can learn successively higher levels of feature that might be useful for your machine learning task. So that's, that's an example of trainable features, okay? So basically, the goal of this lecture, so we have four talks um, in this lecture series, and basically the idea is to help you understand the foundations of neural networks and deep learning at a level that's sufficient for you to start reading research papers in this area. So if you start reading research papers, you see there's a lot of things going on because there's lots of excitement in this field. And hopefully throughout this course, you'll learn to identify what are the main themes and what you need to know to, to actually follow the literature, okay? So here's the schedule. Um, so today, lecture one, we're going to talk about some machine learning background and neural networks. So this might be review for some of you, but hopefully it will be on the same page after this. Okay, and next lecture, we'll actually start talking about deep architectures, in particular two types of architectures. One is called deep belief networks, DBNs, and one is called stacked autoencoders, SAE. Okay. And these, these are sort of what people are excited about these days. Okay. So, so in the second lecture, we'll actually use what we learned in the first lecture and try to build these deep architectures. And in the third lecture, we'll, we'll go into applications 
in particular into computer vision, speech recognition, and language modeling. And we'll see how deep learning is used in those fields. And the main idea of showing these applications to you is so that you see that there's actually a lot of variety in the areas. What people call deep learning in, in vision may be different from what people use in, in speech and language processing. Okay, so this is to give you a sense of the variety of things going on out there. And finally, we'll talk of, about some advanced topics on how to optimize these deep architectures. So for example, things like how to scale it to big data sets or, or how to do hyperparameter optimization, okay? So here's the rough schedule we're, we're gonna follow. So basically, background, deep and applications and, and advanced topics, okay? And there, the main prerequisites for this course is um, a basic calculus, probability, and linear algebra. Okay, so if you, if you know these, you should be fine. Okay. All right, so all the materials um, for this course are on this website, um, on my website. So you can go to my website and find a link there. It's also linked from the, the online syllabus at NIST. Okay. And um, so all the lecture slides and also recommended readings will be on this um, before class. So you can go download them if you want. And also I recommend a couple of references if you want to learn more about this area. And actually a lot of the, um, what I put in the slides here actually come, come out of these useful references. So the, the best one I would recommend is Ben Joe's short book available online. So it's about, um, about 100 pages talking about the idea of using deep architectures. And it's a, it's a very good overview. If you want to more, know more details, um, in vision, I recommend you go watch Likun and Brizanto's tutorial. And for language, I recommend Socher's um, NACO tutorial. So both of these have videos online. So, so it's, it's pretty good. And if you want to know even more, Jeff Hinton's Coursera course is pretty good. Okay. And finally, um, Theano has a, a bunch of Python code examples of the things we'll be talking about. And that's a very good way to get started. And if you need some more background, um, this Bishop's book on pattern recognition and machine learning is, is worth getting. And we actually have a Japanese translation of this in the library as well. Okay. All right. So you might be interested in grading. Um, grading is very simple. The only criteria I care about is whether you're actively participating in asking questions in class, okay? So there's no reports, no attendance. It's all based on do you ask questions or answer questions in class. So if you ask three or more questions, you get A. If you ask two, you get B. If you ask one, you get C. If you don't ask any, you get no credit for this class, okay? So it's very simple. So this is uh, U, U ka. okay? So you have four lecture chances, and you can ask however many questions per lecture, okay? Yeah. Um, in total, in total, yeah. So you can ask three questions today and then you're, you're done, <laughs> okay? All right, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, any, th this counts. So any question that relates to the class, I count, okay? Um, I'll ask you to fill out the, the paper later after class. Yeah. Okay, any questions about this? All right, all right, so basically, I emphasize asking questions because I think it's very important, especially if you're a graduate student. Um, the best advice I, I got when I was a graduate student was, was this, three words, always ask questions. And this professor told me, um, if you don't understand something in class or in, in some talk, you have to ask a question to understand it, right? And if you actually understand it, you naturally will have questions, right? Because if you understand the material, you will keep on thinking about more things. So having no questions is actually a sign that you're not thinking, okay? So always in class or in some lectures, try to think and try to ask questions. All right? So, okay, so that's, that's the introduction to the course, okay? And if you have questions, just raise your hand and stop me anytime, okay? By the way, is my speaking speed okay? English is okay to follow? Okay, all right. 
So here's the topic for today. Um, first, we'll have some basic background in machine learning. Um, this is fairly simple things, but um, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And in particular, I want to focus on the main concept of generalization, model expressiveness, and overfitting. So these are ideas that will keep on coming back when we talk about neural networks. Okay. And the second part of today's talk, um, we'll talk about neural networks. First, we'll talk about one-layer networks, which are basically logistic regression. So these are linear systems. Okay, and we'll talk about how to train these using stochastic gradient descent and all these um, of nice algorithms we have. And that'll be background for how do we train a two-layer network. Okay. So let's get started. All right. So what's the motivation for machine learning? So this is a, a very fundamental question. So here's an example. Why, why machine learning is good for your problem? So suppose you want to write a program that recognizes some digits. Right? So these are images that you scan, and you want to recognize these digits. So, so one, one actual task that people have done is the post office needs to scan people's letters so they can know quickly where to scan the zip code so they can know where to send the, the mail. Right? So you need to recognize these digits with high accuracy. Okay. Now, how do you recognize a digit two? Right? So you can see, okay, these probably look like two, but some are very difficult. Right? Now, if you want to write a program to recognize this, right, you can think of, okay, you have a function, recognize digit as two, take some image pixels, maybe it's a matrix as input, and then it's going to do something and then give you a Boolean out. Right? That's how, but how would you actually implement this function? If you want to think about how to do it, can anyone actually do this by hand? That seems very difficult, right? So the idea of machine learning is, well, it's hard to do these kind of tasks, but we actually have a database of answers, right? So the database are called training data. So we have a training data of a bunch of images. Some are labeled as two and some are labeled as not two. Right? And if we feed this to some um, algorithm that will automatically learn to distinguish twos from non-twos, then we can input that algorithm and put it in here. Right? So that's the idea of machine learning. So rather than, than doing things by hand, you have a set of data and you want to learn that function from the data. Okay? So, so here's one way to do it with machine learning. Right? So for example, let's say our training data are, are matrices of pixels. Okay. So it's either zero or one, saying whether it's the pixel is on or not. So you can see this is a two here, this is a one here, right? This is our input data. And we we have a classifier that's basically the same dimension. The weights of the classifier are the same dimension as this input. And the training procedure is simple. So when we observe this two, we add one to all of the corresponding elements. So here, here is a classifier matrix that we start with. Originally, everything in this matrix is zero, okay? And when we see this image, we see, okay, all these points here, we add one, okay? So when we see this image, we get this. This classifier, we add one here, right? So we get this representation of the classifier. And when we observe some digit that's not a two, we subtract one to the corresponding matrix. So when we see this image, for example, we subtract one and all these elements, right? So that's, all these elements are over here, right? So after we subtract one from these, these get zero and some of them get negative one, right? So this is our classifier in the end, okay? And now when you want to classify something, basically all you do is you take that new image and then you do element-wise multiplication and then you sum everything together. And if the sum is greater than one, or greater than zero, you say it's a two, or else it's, a, it's not a two, right? So that's one way to, to build such a function from training data. Does that make sense? Are people, people all know machine learning here? Okay. All right, so, so that's, that's the main idea, but there are several issues, several important concepts we need to worry about. One is generalization. So the key issue that we have in machine learning is we have great, we have training data, 
but our training data is always limited, right? So if the classifier just memorizes this training data, there's a chance that it may not perform well on your data, okay? And the ability to perform well on new data that it hasn't seen before is called generalization, okay? So you can think of this as when you learn some new material, right? Suppose, suppose you, you come to this class and you memorize all the slides I have, right? Do you actually learn, right? If I give you a new, new problem, can you do it if you memorize all the slides? It might be very hard, right? Because you actually need to, to generalize on what's in the slides so you can apply it to some new task. So that's called generalization. Okay, so, so example is here, right? So say we have some shifted images, right? This is very common, right? The image is shifted this way or this way. And if we directly apply the shifted image to this classifier, can we actually classify it correctly? No, right? So if we can't classify new test images correctly, then that we say that this is a classifier that doesn't generalize well to new data sets, okay? So one, what's one way to fix it? Well, maybe we can um, discretize this weight into fewer elements. So rather than having these many weights, we will discretize the weights so that now each box is actually four pixels. And we have the same learning algorithm. Whenever some input comes in, if that input falls into any of these, we will add one to the whole box, right? So we get something like this. And with this kind of weight matrix, we can actually classify this shifted examples better, right? Because the shifted examples are captured. And you can think of this as some kind of Harzen window estimator or some kernel estimator, where rather than just up updating on the examples you've seen, you, you sort of have a smoothing effect. And this is one way to make your classifier generalize better, is to have fewer parameters so that you can, given some single example, you can also capture things that are not in this example, okay? Is that clear? All right, so, so this gets the idea of model expressiveness. So in general, if, uh, a model has a lot of weights, a lot of parameters. That means you can probably fit the training data better. But since the training data is limited, um, such expressive model actually might have a risk of fitting the training data too well. So there's a trade-off. So you can have less expressive model, meaning that your model has fewer weights, or you can have more expressive model. And if you have very expressive model, Maybe you fit the training data too well. If you have less expressive model, maybe you don't fit the data, you underfit the data. And ideally, you want something that's in between, right? So you don't want to fit the data so, so well that you don't generalize, but you also don't want to underfit the training data so that you actually don't learn enough, okay? And when we talk about deep architectures, basically, it's trying to go towards being more expressive. And when we say that, okay, actually, deep, deep learning Deep neural networks had trouble um, before recent years, and it's because they were overfitting, okay? And basically, new algorithms made it possible to not overfit on these expressive models, okay? All right, so here's an example of model expressiveness and overfitting. Um, I just wanna make sure that, I'm kind of belaboring the point, but just wanna make sure that, that people understand this important concept. So, Suppose we have some training data, and these are some blue points, okay? So this is just some point in one dimension. And this, this data is actually generated by a curve like this, okay? And because it's a limited training data, we only observe some samples along this curve. And your task as a machine learning person is to figure out how to fit this, fit this data. So to fit this data, we use some polynomial model. So this is just a polynomial where we have some weights. And our goal is to find the best weights given the training data. And we, we optimize it so that our function 
difference with the, the actual labels P here is not very large, okay? So we want to adjust the weights so that this is low. And you can have different kinds of models. Right, first, say we have a linear model, so m equals to one, or equals to zero. So that means we want to fit one horizontal line on this data, right? So if we fit one horizontal line on this data, where would you fit it? You can fit it here, you can fit it here. Right? This is probably the best fit if you want to fit all these things. Right? Now, if you want to have m equals one, so then you have this model, and you can fit two numbers now. It's more expressive. So now you can also have a slope, basically. Right, so if you have a slope, then you can maybe fit this. And this is a better fit to the data than before. If you have m equals to two, now you have this model, or m equals to three here. So, so you can fit something like this, which is better. You can actually even go further, right? If m equals to nine, you can fit something like this, and you see that your red curve, your red fit, is actually perfect on all the training examples. So you perfectly fit every single training example, right? But when you actually look at, if you want to generalize with this model here, say what's the value of P here, right? You will say it's here, which is incorrect, right? It's, it's actually here. Right. If you use a less expressive model, you actually get very close. But if you use too, too expressive a model, you might get far away. Okay. So this is a trade-off. In this case, this model, m equals to three, is actually the best fit. It's not too expressive, it's not, not as expressive, okay? Uh, any questions? Yes, yes, so, so if you have a different objective, say, say you have not L2, but you have L1, right? And you try to optimize that, that will give you a different kind of curve. Yeah, in this case, if it's just a screw square, um, it's, a, it's the same objective, so, so it's not a big problem. Yeah, yeah, but you can think of different objectives and that will give you different kinds of curves. And you should pick the objective that makes most sense for your problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So what's, how do you decide what's a good fit and what, what's overfitting? Um, so the easiest way is to prepare a separate data set called a validation data set. So this is something that you don't use to fit your data, but you use it to test and see how well it does over there. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, we don't know the green line. So we have to sort of figure out what's the green line by, by using the, the data points we have. So interpolate it, yeah. Okay. All right, okay. So now let's, let's actually talk about uh, things in more mathematical detail, okay. So this is a setup we have. Our train, we are given the training data and training data is a set of points. It's a set of pairs, actually, X and Y. X is the input, and Y is the output. Right, so you can think of maybe X is the image, and Y is the label of is this two or not two, okay? And I use the superscript N he, M here to represent the training point, okay? So we have a total of big M number of training points. So say, for example, 10,000, big M equals to 10,000. So you have 10,000 training data. And each of this training data, the X is some vector in dimension D, <laughs> and Y is basically either zero or one, okay? 
And our goal as a machine learning person is to learn a function f that maps from x to y. Okay. So this function takes x as a parameter and wants to give y as an output. And we want this function to predict correctly on new inputs that we haven't seen before. So basically, the way to go about this is first you need to choose what kind of function you want to use. So earlier we talked about, okay, we have a, we choose a polynomial family of functions. And we can, in our course, we can say, okay, we choose a logistic regression function model, or choose a support vector machine, or choose a neural network. There's many kinds of things out there that you can choose. And all of these cor corresponds to different kinds of functions. And after you've chosen this function, this cho function model family, um, next you need to optimize the parameters of this function. So this is a general function that has some parameters, and you will fit these parameters to the training data. And to fit it, you need to decide what's your objective, what's your loss function. So for example, here is the loss function, the, the sum of squares function, right? So this is what we've seen before. We want this function, this our learned function's output to be not very different from the true output here. Okay. And we want this sum over all samples. And the hope is that if we minimize this function, we can do well on new training. And maybe you want another kind of objective that adds some other terms, such as regularizers, which I'll talk about later. Yeah. What is large M? Um, large M here is the number of samples in your training data. Yeah, so previous slide, uh, I'm sorry. So previous slide, this is, I should use a different letter name. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the order here, so it's not, M is actually N here in this slide, sorry. Yeah. So the question is, yeah, so the question is, can we reduce it to zero and one? Um, most of the time you can find a reduction of your problem. Say you do speech recognition, right? you're actually not doing zero one, right? You're trying to recognize a word, and the word is, it's not zero one, there's maybe 10,000 words in your vocabulary that you want to recognize. Um, so here, you, Y would be maybe 10,000 different things. Um, so you can try to, try to predict that directly, but there's also ways where you can reduce this multi-class problem to a binary problem. And so in this class, we'll just be focusing on on binary problems, at least for the first talk and the second talk. So for simplicity, we'll just focus on zero, one. Any other questions? By the way, you can ask questions if in Japanese if you want. Okay. All right, so, so now let's actually start talking about um, a particular kind of function model family. Okay. So here, we're going to say f is this function, okay? And you can think of it, it's a linear function um, with some nonlinear t here. So the parameters of this model is w. w is in the same dimension as the input x. So it's an rd, and you basically have a dot product between the x, the input x, and w. Okay. So by this I mean, each element, so this is a vector, each element of this vector is multiplied to each element of this vector and summed together. Right. And then there's b is a scalar bias term. So this is just a single number that makes this large or, or low. So you can think of this, this is basically a line or some hyperplane in, in d-dimensional space. Okay. So this will give you one number and this one number is put through this sigma, which is a nonlinear function. Okay. So here, we'll mostly use the sigmoid, logistic sigmoid as sigma. And it's defined as such. Okay. So any value you, you give into sigma, you put it in here, and that's the output. And th this function actually looks like this. Right. So if you give, give zero here, um, you have one over one plus one. So that's 0.5, okay? 
Now, if you increase z here, you're going to make this number small, so that will approach 1. Sigma will approach 1. So as you increase z, sigma will approach 1. And as you decrease z, it'll go the other way. Sigma will get, uh, this part will get near infinity, and this one will approach 0. Okay. So, so this sigmoid is a nonlinear function that looks like this. Okay. And um, later it'll come out, we use sigmoid because of some elegant properties. So by using some nonlinear functions, we can actually gain more model expressiveness when we do a two-layer net or three-layer network. And this, this nonlinearity is essential to, to model expressiveness. If we don't have any nonlinearities, then when we put things together, everything will be linear. So a multi-layer linear net is the same as a single-layer net. And um, for simplicity, most of the time I'll just write this. So we can put this bias term into x. So we can define x as x appended by 1 and w as the origin of w appended by b. Okay. So just for simplicity, I'll just write this. Okay. And you can think of this b term as basically adding a bias. Right? So, so earlier I said if z is 0, you get this. Right, so B basically adds a bias, right? So you can, B will, will shift this curve this way or this way. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So this part is important. It's basic, but um, this is the foundation of everything we'll be doing. Yeah. Okay. Why do we need to shift the curve? So it depends on on what your input is, right? So sometimes maybe your inputs are all of positive value and you want to make sure that, um, so everything will be here, right? Maybe your weights are all positive, x is all positive, you're always over here and you can't, you do, you do, you're not doing any decision. Right? You can think of this is saying you're predicting a one and this is saying you're predicting a zero, right? So you need to shift this sometimes. Yes, B is also a parameter that you need to optimize. Was there another question? Okay. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, so I just mean that it's a concatenation. So, yeah, so, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's many functions. So for example, one other function that's often used in neural network is the hyperbolic tangent. And it's defined like this, but it's actually, you can think of, it's like the sigmoid, but it's shifted up. Oh, sorry, it's shifted down, wider. So it's either plus one or minus one in the output. And you might want to do that depending on whether you want negative values in your network or not. But yeah, there's other things. So you can also have, later we'll talk about um, linear rectifier units that actually look like this. And there's many different ways to, to do things. But this is a standard. And the nice thing about this is that it's a smooth function. So we can, we can compute the derivative here. And later when we talk about um, doing training, we need to compute derivative. And with a smooth function, it's, it's easy to do. Okay, so now, so we've defined the function model family. Next thing is we actually need to optimize these weights on the training data, okay? So let's assume that we have some loss function. We're just going to optimize this loss, called square error loss. And so I've said this before, so this is our output f. So this is what our function predicts. And we basically want to adjust w so that the prediction is similar to the true label w y, okay? And we want it to be, minimize this loss, okay? Over all n samples. So I'll do the derivation over square error loss. Um, when you read textbooks or you read the literature, you often come across something called cross entropy loss. So this is an alternative to square error loss. And depending on what you want to do, sometimes it's actually more, um, more natural to do. But 
for demonstration purposes, I'll do everything by this lens. Okay. So how do we optimize? So first of all, um, if you think back into basic calculus, now you have a function, right? You have a function. This is the function you want to optimize. This is the objective you want to optimize. And this objective depends on these w terms and this function. Okay. So to optimize some function, basically the easiest way is you take the gradient, right? And you try to minimize on that function. So if you think of this, say you have some function. So this is the loss function. So we have the loss function and the function which is a sigmoid, and don't confuse them, right? So this is the loss function we want to optimize. So the y-axis is loss, w-axis is w, or x-axis is w. And basically you're thinking, how do we adjust w so that we can get the minimum here? Okay, that's what we want to do with optimization. And the easiest way to do so is to find a gradient, right? So say on this function, you can define the gradient on any point w, you can find the gradient, which is the basically the, you can think of it as the, the tangent of this curve. And if you go in the opposite direction of the gradient, you can go towards the right answer, okay? So that's why we want the gradient. Okay. So to get the gradient, um, we basically just take the derivative, right? So we want to differentiate this loss term with respect to w, right? So first of all, we differentiate with this with respect to w. Um, this two comes down, cancels this part, and this part stays, right? So that's this part. And then by chain rule, we need to differentiate this inner part, right? So, so we get this with respect to w. So this part gets, this is a der derivative of sigmoid, and this part cancels out. Uh, it gets to zero because there's no w term here, right? And then by chain rule again, we need to differentiate the inside part of the sigmoid with respect to w, and that will be x, okay? So basically this is what the gradient looks like. Um, do people follow this? Is this okay? Okay, so we'll be doing lots of um, derivatives in this talk. So if you don't follow, please try to um, study it beforehand. Okay, any questions here? All right. So if you look at the general form of this gradient, it looks like this. There's this error term. You can think of this is how different your prediction is from the truth. That's the error term. And that error term is multiplied by this derivative term. So this is a derivative on the sigmoid itself, okay? And I'll use the notation in to represent this w dot product with x, okay? So in is basically what goes into this sigmoid. So this is just a convenient shorthand because there's too many things to keep track of. And then multiply by the actual sample x. So everything, actually everything we do, and the math might look very complicated, but every time when you take the gradient, it looks something like this, okay? You always have an error term, some derivative term, depending on the nonlinearity, and then the input, actual sample. So what, what does this derivative of a sigmoid look like? Um, it's actually a very nice looking function. The derivative of sigmoid is simply this, okay? And you can go through the, the derivations. Um, should we go through it here? Do people wanna go through it here? Or skip it? Yes or no? We'll skip it then. But um, so basically, you can think of this: the derivative of the sigmoid is basically the slope of the sigmoid, right? So you can think: what's the slope as of this function? When z is very small, the slope is zero. Okay. 
And gradually, as z gets bigger, the slope is increasing. And the slope is the maximum at this point. Right? And then as you pass this point, the slope is starting to decrease again. Okay, so it actually looks like this. You can think if, if z is 0, then you have um, 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. So that's actually the maximum of this derivative. When z is very small or very large, one of this term will be zero. So, so the derivative becomes zero. Okay. Okay. Yes? Yes. So well, given the condition, we want to minimize the loss function. Yes. Okay, so the question, does it have to be local or optimal? So, um, when we talk about logistic regression, so this is a linear, it's actually convex in W. So we can, if we do a gradient um, optimization, we can actually get the global minimum. So later when we talk about neural networks using two layers, it's no longer convex. So um, we can only find the local optimum there and there's no way around it. Okay, so, so now that we know the gradient, how do we actually train the, the, the function? Um, one very simple is just gradient descent, okay? So we start, with, start out with some initial w, some randomly initialized w vector. And then from this w, we can compute the gradient at that point, right? So the gradient is what, what we just derived earlier. So you can think of it as you go through each training sample you feed it through your logistic regression, then you can get this in term and you can calculate this, right? And you, you also know what's the error of your logistic regression. And when you sum everything together, basically it tells you a direction where you should go. And so you basically update in the negative of that direction. So you go to, that's why it's called gradient descent, you go to the negative of this gradient direction. And this gamma is some scaling parameter called, called uh, learning rate. Okay. And you just keep on iterating this until you converge, until the weights don't change much anymore. Then you know you actually get to the best W that optimizes this function. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, so the, will the result be dependent on the initialization? Well, if, if you have a convex objective, it doesn't matter because any point on the convex function, if you do take the gradient, you always get to the, the same point in the end. But if you have a non-convex function that you want to optimize, then it actually matters where you start. And when we talk about deep learning, um, actually one, one hypothesis why recent methods in deep learning work is it, it has a better initialization of of this optimization procedure. Yeah, so it matters if it's a non-convex function. Okay. All right, so, so this is the standard gradient descent, but what we mostly will use is what's called stochastic gradient descent. And this is a slight variant of gradient descent, but it's, it's actually um, more useful in practical scenarios um, if you have large data sets. So here you notice when you compute the gradient, you're summing over all samples, right? So if your training data is very large, you have to do this sum every single step and that's very expensive, right? So stochastic gradient descent basically says, rather than doing the sum, I'm just going to update whenever I see one sample, okay? So whenever, for each sample in the training set, I'm just going to compute that single sample's error, and I'm just going to update the weights right away. And we sample over, we loop this over the training data many times. And it can be shown that this actually can converge um, under some conditions to the same um, result as this one. But it can be faster because you don't have to sum over all the samples every single time. Okay, yes.
radius. So yeah, so you can think of this stochastic, so this is a stochastic approximation of the true gradient. Right, so this is uh, the gradient of this single sample, but you actually have multiple samples that you need to average, and you're only sampling one of them. Okay. So um, one thing to note is that learning rate here and the stopping criterion that you actually use are important practice, and we'll talk about this in detail later. Okay, so this is one of the, the black magic that you need to figure out when you're doing doing SGD. Okay. Okay, so um, so now I just want to give you an intuition. So if if so actually have people seen stochastic gradient descent before? How many people have seen it? Okay, so maybe half. Okay. So just to give you an idea, why why does this make sense? Um, so we go through an example. Why does it make sense to update W like this? Okay. So now let's just break out these terms, okay? So this is the prediction term I'm writing in this column. This is the actual label, okay? And then let's just suppose that we have several cases we can think of. The label can be either zero or one, okay? And your prediction can be either zero or one as well. So actually this is a continuous gradient from zero to one, but let's just say, for now let's see the examples of zero or one. So if y is zero and you're predicting zero, then your error term is zero, right? If y is one and you predict one, what's the error term? It's also zero, right? Because you're, you're predicting correctly. Now, if the error term is zero here, what happens to w? Yeah, nothing changes, right? So if this is zero, everything here becomes zero, and so your w just stays the same. So basically, when you see the same sample again, what will be your new prediction? Because you don't change the w, your new prediction will be the same as the old prediction here. Right? Okay, now suppose you actually have an incorrect prediction. Suppose the label is one, but you predict zero. So zero minus one, the error is minus one. So now you're going to have this form. Right? The new w will be this. In the opposite case, so you predict one and the true thing is zero, then your new W will look like this. And what's the effect of this change? When you add something, add a positive thing to W in this direction of XM, you're going to make the new prediction of XM um, have a larger value. Okay, so you can see that basically you can think of take this term and you take the dot, so this is a new W, right? Take this new W and you take the dot product with XM again. And you can multiply this in, so you get S W X and this term. And this these are all positive. So, so basically you get this term is larger than this term, right? So by adding, by adding in a term in the direction of xm here, you're going to make sure that your new input to the sigmoid will be larger than before. Okay. So then you're going to basically make this in, in increase next time. In the opposite case, if it's a negative, you're going to make this decrease next time. Okay. So basically you can get closer to the true answer. Does that make sense? I think if you understand this slide, then um, all of SGD becomes really simple. So you can think of, if people know perceptron, it's kind of similar, right? Um, you're going to, when you get an incorrect classification in the perceptron, you're going to add your sample as to the vector. And that's going to increase the probability of so increase the, the score you give to this sample. Do you have questions? Okay. Okay. Now, some other things to note is this. Um, so this derivative of the sigmoid is near zero, right? So we say it's when, when we are at the very large negative or very 
large positive terms, this is near zero. So basically, if you're very confident about your prediction, um, this will be close to zero, then your weight won't change anymore. Okay. But in the beginning, if you're not confident about your prediction and you're operating at the region that's sort of in the center of the sigmoid, then you will actually update these weights. Um, another thing to look at is this learning rate gamma. Okay. So if you think if gamma is really large, basically you're going to update very aggressively. You're going to increase W a lot so that you can make it make the sample be correctly classified. But because we're doing this one sample at a time, we might actually do worse on other samples. So you might be too aggressive. So if you make gamma small, you're being more conservative, saying we're not going to change as much. And this is now a trade-off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's a sort of geometric view, just to a different view of, of SGD. Okay. So here I'm going to plot the loss objective contour. And we're going to think of it in a 3D space. So, so this plane is W. We have two Ws to optimize. And you can think of this as a mountain coming, coming out towards you. And these are the contours. So here is the largest, and then gradually it decreases. And here is a valley. So basically, we want to get to this valley. And we start with some um, initial W on this mountain. And we want to do a descent on this mountain. So when we take the gradient, the true gradient of this, this objective, it will be perpendicular to the actual contours, right? because it's a tangent. So if we do gradient descent, maybe we'll go like this, and then gradually we get to the center to the valley. Now if we do stochastic gradient descent, it's not going to go perpendicular to the contours anymore because it's taking a sample. So you can think of it's a noisy direction. Most of the time it'll point in the same direction, but sometimes it'll actually wander off. Okay. So maybe it'll, it'll go like this. And if your learning rate is set correctly, in the end, you will get to around the same point as the gradient descent. And here you can think of this learning rate basically will say how far you go, right? So if you set a very large learning rate, you go very far. If you set a very small learning rate, you go small. And the, if you have a very large learning rate, although this point it says you should go this direction to minimize, if you go too far, you actually go uphill again, right? So that's why the learning rate is important. So far, so good. Okay. So um, in practice, what people do is um, they actually do something called mini match um, stochastic, mini batch stochastic gradient descent. So rather than taking only one single sample, maybe you take 10 samples or 100 samples or 1,000 1, samples and take the gradient average of those samples. And that's sort of a, a trade-off between using the entire data and using only a single point. And that usually works well in practice. So, so I said that learning rate is important, and here's an example of, of learning rate. Um, so one, basically, one thing we want to do is we want the learning rate to be as, as large as possible so we can optimize very fast, but we also don't want it to be too large so that we actually go uphill again. And one common heuristic people do is basically make the learning rate decrease as a fraction of t, which is the number of iterations you've done. Okay. So look at, it's like this curve. The more samples you've seen, gradually the learning rate decreases by one over the number of samples. Okay. And this is one, one common heuristic people do. Okay. So here's what, what actually happens in practice. Um, can you see these curves OK? So, okay, let's see. So here, let's look at, if we just do stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate of 0.2, and that's a green curve, okay? And you see this is a loss objective. So it decreases, and then it converges. So 
the more samples you see, it just doesn't improve anymore. Okay, so that's point two. Now the blue curve is one, using a learning rate of one, so you actually um, are more aggressive. And that's a blue curve you can hardly see here. But you can see the blue curve drops faster than the green curve because it's ag aggressively updating. But then it actually converges at a higher value than the green curve. And that's because your, your step is too big, so you're always crossing over this value, right? So you can think of, in this case, if your gradient step is too big, you always go here and go here and go here, go back. You, you have to decrease it so that you can actually go in the middle. Okay. So these other curves represent um, dividing it by t. Right, so you can see, for example, say you have one divided by t here, and that's this curve, <coughs> the blue cross curve here. And you can see it decreases fast in the beginning as usual, but then as you see more data, it gets even better compared to this curve. So this might seem like a detail, and it is a detail, but if you actually want to implement things yourself, these kind of things become very important. All right, any questions? Yeah. So uh, the general function, how do you affect the input state of the device? Yes. Uh, many many people think that the general algorithm is part of the input, but it is not the case. Yeah. So is there a different way of considering it? Yes, yes. So yeah, so basically that's what's happening here, right? So I mean it's converging, but it's converging at a higher loss. So so gamma actually affects two things. One is the speed at which you decrease the function, and the other is the actual lowest point you can get on the function. Okay. And there's actually a lot of research on adaptive learning rates. So you want to change the learning rate depending on where you are on a function. And maybe you, you have a different rate learning rate for each feature. So that's, that's actually a very recent line of research. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if your learning rate is very small, you basically take tiny steps and you can, you can probably get to the lowest point, but you have to wait a long time. Yeah. Okay, the Oracle um, in this paper is, um, so given the, in this one, they actually know the true function. So given the gradient, yeah, you know the target loss function you want to optimize. So given the gradient, you actually know how far you must go, right? So um, before it, it goes uphill again. So that's the or Yes, yes. Yeah, so the oracle, so this actually, if you actually have the best learning rate, you change the learning rate at each step, you can get this. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a, a more advanced thing, so they actually take into account the variance of the features and the weights. So um, you should, if you're interested, you can look at this paper. So they do some adaptive learning rate. So they show that this is, this is better sometimes. Yeah. But the main point I wanna show is that learning rate, um, usually um, you want to start with some large value and then you decrease it as you see more data. And that's a good heuristic. Now another issue that we need to worry about is generalization. Right, so we say that we're optimizing on this thing. Right, so um, this is saying that if we fit the training data well like this, we're sort of implicitly hoping that it will do well on new data. Um, turns out if you, if you just do this objective, it's not going to work well. You need some sort of um, regularizer or early stopping. So this goes to a question earlier. So one, one simple thing is to add a regularization term. So here you want the norm, you add the norm of W. And basically, if your weights become very large, then this loss becomes big. So you want your weights to be small. And you can think of this as, if your weights are too 
your weights are very large, then your output is going to be very sensitive to small changes in x. Right? So it decreases the sensitivity if you put a L2 norm here. So actually, the, the figure I have here um, has an L2 norm. And that's why you get this parabolic shape. So that's one way to make sure that you generalize well. A second way is called early stopping. And it's basically the validation set thing I mentioned earlier. So you, you prepare separate training and validation. Sometimes it's called development set. Okay. And you optimize just on the training step, and you also measure on the uh, validation stop step. So and you stop when the validation set stops improving. So here's an example where this is a curve from the training set, and this is a curve from the validation set. If you just keep on going, you can, you can, you can see this is actually gradually decreasing, and you can go on forever, go for a long time. But if you look at the validation set, the error actually starts imp increasing a little bit here, so you stop here. And that's one way called error, um, early stopping to make sure you have a generalization. In practice, um, in neural networks, both of these are used together to make sure you generalize well. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So this is the iteration, and this is the loss. This is the training data loss, and this is the validation data loss. So basically, you can think of everything depends on the objective function that we're trying to optimize, right? So we set up this as our objective function and want to tune w, right? So this is sum over m, which is the training sample. So we can keep on trying to improve on the training sample. And that's why this keeps on decreasing, right? But it gets to the point where you're working too hard, you're trying to memorize the training sample, and you actually don't do well on new data. So that's why um, it's good to look at a separate data set to decide when to stop. So you don't stop when the optimization algorithm says I've converged. You stop before that. You stop when on the validation set, um, you, you start to, to get worse errors. So you can think of this is a difference between optimization and machine learning. Right? In optimization field, people just have one function and they want to minimize it. And they, they just want to get the lowest point on this function. But in machine learning, that's not enough. Right? You don't only want to get to a low point on the function, but you also want to make sure this point is actually a good point that will work for future data set. And so you actually don't really want the lowest point all the time. Um, yeah, so that's that you don't know, right? So um, you can keep on running and see what happens. And then basically use your intuition on, on that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but you can do that for each iteration, right? Um, arbitrary, I mean, it's best if you say, pick a random sample from the training data so that you balance things out. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, um, so you think of cross-validation, which is a more fancy form of this.
on the training set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, I won't talk much about these issues um, of gamma and of these generalization anymore. But I think when later when we talk about neural nets and deep learning, we will be using this implicitly anyways. Yeah, I mean that's another that you can do that. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah, there's many var variations of how to how to do these kind of things. Okay. Okay. So so to summarize this part, um, we have training data x and y, m samples of them. And first we choose a model family. Here we choose a logistic regression, which is basically sigmoid and a linear model. And when we optimize under the squared error loss, um, we can take the gradient of this loss and it looks like this form. And using this form, we can basically do stochastic gradient update. So for example, we take go into the negative direction of the gradient and we talked about issues of um, speed and convergence and generalization. Okay. So that's all for this first part of the, the talk. Um, are there any questions? Maybe we'll take a short break, maybe five minutes. Or do people want to go, go without break? Okay, let's take a, a two minute break then, all right. <laughs> yeah, and if you have any questions, just ask.
Okay, should we get started? Okay, so, so for the next part, we're going to talk about neural networks, in, in particular two-layer nets, okay? All right, so the two-layer network is, is actually a simple extension of the logistic regression we've seen before. So you can view logistic regression as this part. So you have some input x, and you multiply it with some weights, and you give some output h. And now, whoa, you're going to have multiple logistic regression, OK? So here's logistic regression number one, logistic regression number two, and logistic regression number three. And that forms this hidden layer. And on top of that, you'll, you're going to put another logistic regression. So this is a two-layer neural network. This is layer, the first layer and the second layer, OK? And if you write it out, basically it looks like this. So now the function, the function f of x is first a logistic regression over these terms. So this is a sigmoid over sum of hj's. So h, hj's are these terms. Okay, so hj minus uh, times wj. When you sum it together, it gives you this output. And actually, we'll have some bias term as well, which I ignore here. Okay, and what's hj? hj is actually coming from logistic regression as well. So this hj term is actually the, like this, right? So this is hj is basically the sum of xij times xi over i, OK? So, um, so in all the slides coming up, I'm going to use this notation where the input xi represents one sample, OK? And i ranges from 1 to the number of features, OK? So now you have four features in your sample, in the single sample. So earlier, I have a superscript m, right? This is the actual sample ID. I'm just, because we're doing, say, stochastic grad gradient descent, we're just not going to worry about M here, OK? So xi, x subscript i, is the actual feature. So you can think of this as maybe pixel value. So there are four pixels in your image, OK? And these wij's is the first layer, logistic regression, right? So i i is this side, and j is this side. So it's going from, from i to j. OK, so 1, 1 means it goes from x1 to h1. 1, 2 means it goes from x1 to h2, OK? And if you have w2, 1, you're going from this to this, OK? So that's a notation I'm going to use. And these h's are called hidden nodes because um, they are actually not observed in the data. Right, so in your training data, you only have the x and you have the y. So this h is something that's hidden from you that you actually make up. Okay. And so the hidden node hj, so this is subscript j is this layer. Hidden node j um, is, is this term, and it'll be multiplied by wj to give the final output. Okay. So that's the notation. Yes? Yes, wij is a weight for each feature. Yeah, yeah. These weights are different. Actually, it's best to think of it from H's perspective. So H, H1, gets four weights from x1 to x4, OK? So these, these four terms multiply up to form h1. So all the weights could be different.
yeah, it's different. Everything's different. And so you decide the number of hidden nodes, and that will, and also that will decide the number of weights that you can have. Did that answer your question? Uh, こう考えればいい。あの、ロジスティックレッションは3つあります。だ、この人、この実際は一緒にやってるけど、これはフィーチャーのこと。サンプルじゃない。これ一つサンプルは4次元になってます。あの、オッケー。それはあの、エクスプレッシブになりたいから。その元々のフィーチャーはいろんなあの。組み合わせ方があるで、一つだけ使ったら一つだけの組み合わせ方ができる。で、そこがニューラルネットワークスの強み。いろんな組み合わせ方でいろんなヘッドモノを出して、で、これ全部違うものになってもいい。Are you thinking in terms of computational neuroscience? So, um, so because neural networks were inspired by neuroscience, um, but I'm not going to talk about it much because, I mean, it's just inspired. There's a lot of differences in what we actually do. Um, so, but what we do is, you can think of these as separate neurons, and the synaptic weights could be different for each neuron. Right? It's actually. So there I'll explain why we want to do this, okay? And why we want to have different weights. Okay. But basically you can view this as this H is now a new feature, right? So you have some original feature in X, and you're gonna combine this into some new feature called H. So this is now a new feature vector H that you use to train. Okay. So why why is this good? So basically, um, the the easiest way is to view this this picture here. So now let's suppose we just have two features. Okay. So now we have a, a neural network where um, it's only like this. Okay. So we have three hidden nodes and two two input x one x two. Okay. And this is showing the decision surface for H1, okay? So for the white part, it means that it predicts zero. For the blue part, it means it predicts one, okay? So you can think of it as you set X11 and X12 such that um, when, when X11 and X2, when they're in this area, H1 is is positive, and otherwise it's zero, okay? So with, with a single logistic regression, you can basically get a, a linear cut of the space like this. Does that make sense? Does this visualize make sense? Okay, so for another hidden node, suppose you set a different weight, okay? 
So it set a different weight, then it has a different decision surface. So maybe you set the weight so that um, this part is plus and this part is zero. Similarly, for the third unit, you can have a different weight. And that'll give you a different thing. Okay. So when you actually combine these three pictures together, right, you can get the decision surface that looks linear. Right, so you can think of the weight from H1 up, H2 up. Let's just make them all add together. So weight is one for all of them. And then you add these pictures together, and you get this. So you can get a very complicated function where only when x1 and x2 are in this points do you get a 0. Otherwise, it's 1. Okay. And there's, there's no way to get this kind of complicated function if you only have a linear model. So if you only have one layer, no matter how hard you try, your decision function is always linear. Okay. But when you put a second layer above it, because you're combining linear layers together, then you can get any nonlinear function. And that's the power of neural network, the two-layer network thing. So in particular, um, if you have a two-layer net, um, there's a theory saying that you can actually approximate any nonlinear smooth function with a two-layer network. So it's a universal function approximator. As long as you have enough hidden units, any shape you want to make, you can say you want to have, say, a very complicated shape. You just have many hidden units, all of them with different varying hyperplanes, and that will give you the shape you want. Okay. So theoretically, a two-layer net can approximate anything in the world, uh, any continuous thing in the world. Okay. So that's why um, people like neural networks. It's, it's very expressive, right? You can approximate many things. And there's also theory saying that, actually, if you have more than two layers, you can approximate any function with fewer nodes. Okay. So already with two-layer nets, you can approximate any function if you have infinite number of hidden nodes. But if you have three or more layers, you can approximate using fewer nodes. Okay. So that's why you want deep. It's we can have fewer weights, so we can make sure that we generalize well and still have a lot of model expressive. How many number of nodes can be decreased by increasing number? That's a good question. So um, I think it's actually hard to, to say, depending on what you want to, to optimize. Um, so but you can think of it generally as, say you want, um, maybe the best is to look at this picture we had in the beginning of the So this face picture, right? So you can think of now we have these three layers where putting these edges can form parts of faces and putting parts of faces can form a true face. You can also think of you can actually put these edges directly to form this face, right? So you have fewer layers, right? You can directly go from here to here. But if you do that, then maybe you need more, more curves here, okay? And especially, um, you might need many, many different orientations of curve to, to make it approximate these kind of lines. Okay. All right. So, so basically, um, the two-layer net is good in terms of model expressiveness, and the question remains, okay, now how do we actually train it, okay? Okay, we're actually short on time. So um, I'll discuss how we train a, a two-layer neural network next talk, okay, in Thursday. Um, but just to give you a brief idea, basically it's the same thing where we want to take the, the derivative with respect to W and now, rather than a simple derivative, there's a, a chain rule involved. So there's more terms involved. 
So again, we predict and then we adjust weights and find the error just like when we do STD, okay? So, so I'll, I'll talk about how we derive this next lecture, okay? So to sum up this part, um, basically by extending from one layer to two layer net, we get a dramatic increase of model expressiveness and that's why people like neural networks and that's why people want to do deep neural networks. And next time we'll talk about how to train them using backpropagation. And it turns out that actually backpropagation has some problems um, if you have a deep network. So it can work well for two layer network, but for a deep network, it has some optimization issues. And, and that's basically what deep learning is about, is doing what backpropagation can't do. So that's it for, for the talk today. Um, if, are there any final questions? Okay, so you can think of hidden layer, what's the computation cost of hidden layer? Um, depends on, on what you do, but actually it's not that big, right? So you can think of everything is, you have some input, and the input is some multiplication and some sum, right? It'll give you the output. So if you have a hardware that's very good at doing this kind of thing, which we do, right? All the CPUs, or the GPUs are very good at doing these multiplications, then it's actually very fast to compute each of these things. So to go from the bottom to compute the top, um, it's very fast. Right? And it, it's scalable as well. You can parallelize most of the computation. What's, what's expensive is when you want to train these things. Right? So when you want to find the best weights, then, then it becomes very expensive. Okay, so, okay. so for people who came in late, um, so this, the grading of this class will be based on whether you've asked questions in class, okay? So um, if you ask one question in any of the four lectures, you, you pass, okay? So um, just for you, okay? So that's it for today. And if you, have qu if you ask questions or answer questions today, can you come up to write your name and the questions you asked so we, I can keep track, okay? All right, so see you on Thursday. <laughs>